Realms of Ruin looks to take on the classic Dawn of War with its unique mechanics and features some fantastic game modes that will satiate many a Warhammer fan. However, you'll need to employ some heavy micro and a good dose of tolerance to really soak in everything that the game has to offer, good and bad. Hello everybody, this is Havoc and welcome to my review on Warhammer Age of Sigmar Realms of Ruin. A huge shout out to Frontier as always for the early access, it's greatly appreciated but will not affect the opinions stated in this video. Let's dive in. Beginning with, what is Realms of Ruin? A look into the Age of Sigmar. Warhammer Age of Sigmar Realms of Ruin is not just a mouthful of a title, but a Warhammer game set in, you guessed it, the Age of Sigmar. Now I won't get into the nitty gritty lore because well, for one, I'm no expert and two, it's not entirely relevant to the video, but at its base, the Age of Sigmar is an era post-Warhammer Old World set in the mortal realms. Eight interconnected realms where the forces of order, chaos, death, and destruction all fight for dominance. It's a time where the god king Sigmar reforges the souls of warriors who died valiantly fighting chaos into what could be the most iconic image of this Age of Sigmar, the Stormcast Eternals. And should a Stormcast fall, Sigmar would be able to reforge them, send them back into the battlefield. Realms of Ruin takes place during this Age of Sigmar and more specifically centers its campaign around the mortal realm of Gur, as a group of Dawnbreaker Crusaders fight to keep their city from falling to relentless raids of Auric Cruel Boys, resorting to pushing deep into the Swampland to procure an arcane artifact that may or may not be sinister in nature. The campaign has been great so far with an enjoyable narrative and with a story written by Black Library author Gavin Thorpe, it looks like I have a new book that I need to read after this review. Now I'll let you explore the campaign details on your own, so we'll leave it at that and move on to the game's traditional RTS setting, familiarity mm, with a twist. If you've ever played any of the Dawn of War franchise, be it the first game or the second one, you'll find a familiar progression of gameplay in Realms of Ruin. Starting with a single base, you'll capture arcane conduits using your troops. Capturing these conduits will provide you with a base resource of command, and upgrading these conduits provides a range of benefits such as Realm Stone, healing, or a type of tower defense you'll then use to recruit more troops, purchase technological upgrades, and level up your main base to provide higher tiered troops. On top of that, there are victory points throughout the map that you'll need to capture as well, and on controlling a majority, we'll start to tick down the opponent's victory points. These victory points are captured very quickly, which means at any point, tables can turn against you, forcing a reaction, potentially causing an issue of being able to cover other important regions of the map. This gameplay loop is present in all modes in Realms of Ruin. We'll get to those modes in just a bit but it's easy to see the connection to this very classic system of balancing resources, troops, upgrades, and conquests. This game is very approachable as a result, and outside of the game-specific mechanics, such as different mouse modes or keeping troops inside of region to expand its influence, it was immediately familiar in my hands. The game features four factions, two of which I've already mentioned, the Stormcast Eternals, Auric Cruel Boys, Nighthaunt, a phantom faction of the undead, and the recently revealed Disciples of Zinch. And even these factions will feel immediately familiar to those who played, well, about any traditional RTS. Your Stormcast Eternals are every Terran-based faction, without putting it too harshly or negatively. They are tough, they are tanky, and have the most well-balanced roster of the four. They are your typical beginner faction, as they allow you to grasp the mechanics of the game, looking stunning while doing so. They are the primary faction of the campaign, and give you the best look at the game as a whole. Auric Cruel Boys play dirty, it's no other way to say it. They're willing to sacrifice cheap, weaker forces to keep you engaged, then bring in their beasts to take care of the rest. A lot of what this faction entails is sneaky getting and trap laying to suck in troops that think they may know better and get found out quick. The Night Hunt is my least played faction thus far and only due to the lack of time that I've been able to play. That being said, their ethereal composition and regeneration skills means that unlike most of the other factions, if you don't take care of them entirely from the get-go, you're going to have issues with them in quick succession and might be overwhelmed by their larger unit sizes in a hurry. As a fan of just about any Chaos God, but preferring Nurgle, seeing the Disciples of Zinch in the game is fantastic and they look great on top of it. 
Of course, relying on magic more than any of the other factions, this is a very ranged, heavy faction, able to utilize those types of attacks even for melee units before they get stuck in battle. I've really enjoyed playing as these guys, although I think they definitely take the most micromanaging to fully gain their potential. With these four factions, you have, again, a very traditionalist setup, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. The game's mechanics almost require this approach, and I think it works extremely well. The only downside would be if you were expecting another type of genre to play into this RTS because, well, it doesn't. This is firmly an action RTS, and no matter whether you're playing the campaign, conquest mode, or multiplayer, as you play, one of the most crucial things to keep in mind is the concept of the combat triangle, rock, paper, scissors to the extreme. Realms of Ruin plays deeper into the traditionalist RTS games by leaning into the combat triangle. All units outside of heroes fall into one of these three categories, sword, shield, and bow, and each type will counter one of the others. Sword counters shield, shield counters bow, and bow counters sword. The combat triangle is even relevant across tiers, where a tier 2 shield unit might be relatively stronger than a tier 1 sword, it will still struggle against it keeping the stronger unit engaged for longer than you might like and allowing your opponent to send in reinforcements. With this, as you play, you will 100% need to be mindful of your opponent's unit structure in order to effectively combat their armies. This is a crucial component to understand as you have a limited number of units you can deploy into the battlefield and a miscalculation in your own army composition could result in a devastating encounter that will not be quickly recovered from. You aren't SOL if you're caught on the wrong side of the combat triangle though, as you have the ability to retreat, disengaging you from battle. However, your unit will scurry back to the main base, and there's nothing you can do to stop it, on top of costing resources to do the action, so you have to weigh the importance of either managing said resources or losing a unit. Honestly, the best option is pretty much to always retreat. Traditions aside, it's time to take a closer look at Realm of Ruins combat systems, the Curse of the Micro and Keybind Gods. Realms of Ruin's combat system is where the game takes a path away from tradition and not to its benefit. First, combat is locked, meaning when any opposing units engage in battle, you cannot disengage them outside of a retreat. This in of itself isn't a bad mechanic, as it forces a player to pay attention to their groups and makes engagements have purpose, or you pay the consequences. I'm in favor of this, and never in the multiple betas, demos, or early access did locked engagement frustrate me. However, about everything else surrounding combat does. The largest complaint centers around the two mouse modes in the game, one to command a unit to move to a certain spot, one to command them to attack a certain unit. These mouse modes are switched using the F key, and while there's nothing wrong with key bindings to a degree, it feels completely unnecessary to have two modes of mouse click. This causes an immense amount of frustration in the chaos of engagements, big or small. In any game similar in genre, all you need to do is right-click on an enemy, and your forces will know exactly what to do, which is obviously to attack, because what else would you have right-clicked on an enemy unit to do? Now, more often than not, I will forget that I need to hit F to switch to combat mouse mode, and my units will literally run through the enemy unit till the hitboxes decide to clash, and then I have five units, all in melee, instead of a coordinated attack of mixed ranged and otherwise. And speaking of hitboxes, whatever mechanic is tied to deciding when units decide to engage doesn't seem consistent or logical. And I'll often have units run completely through an enemy unit in a mouse move click, then suddenly get rubber banded back to engage in combat. I'm already hearing that little dude on my shoulder saying, well, just get good and learn to hit F, you noob. And while there's an aspect to that, combined with all the other key binds you currently need to learn, that F key is the last daggum key that I should or want to think about. There is a lot of key binding and micromanagement needed in this game. Units and heroes alike all have unique abilities. There are key binds for all of your base needs. In a selected group of units, you can toggle shift to cycle through these units, which is 100% cool, but yet another key that I need to remember to click in order to micro effectively. And in the chaos of some of the larger engagements, my brain just tends to freeze or I misclick and waste resources on an ability I didn't need or I land my prosecutors when I'm into special attack with them. It's honestly overwhelming to me at times and even more of a reason why I don't need multiple mouse modes. That aspect of get good is relevant, but I think there comes a point where it's too micro heavy 
or having a game too reliant on key binding forces a higher actions per minute throughout tense points of the game that a majority of the player base just won't have the skills for. I'm no noob, but neither am I a multiplayer wizard, so perhaps I fall into the lower end of the gaming ability spectrum, or perhaps there's just too much going on at times in the game. This wouldn't be such a big issue for myself if combat weren't 95% plus of the game. Figuring out where to move troops on top of the combat triangle, on top of the mouse clicks and ability keybinds, combat systems are so crucial to grasp. And I think it has the capacity to be too much to handle appropriately without some degree of esports level skills. There's also the lack of unit engagements. That's the flip side of the locked engagement where my units will be inches away from fellow units locked in battle and just sit there like there's nothing going on, watching their fellow brethren get wrecked while I'm away from that specific part of the map. Ranged units can sort of understand and be okay with, as they're designed to only fire within a field that the player can purposefully set. That mechanic works well enough, although I wouldn't mind a form of Overwatch where ranged units swing their gaze back and forth like the towers do in campaign. But melee troops, there should be some form of area of effect where if a friendly unit is engaged within X distance, even a minimally short distance, heck, preferably within a very short distance, they'll auto engage as well. I cannot express how many times I've lost a unit of men while dealing with another battle across the map where friendly is quite literally right next to them, but hasn't triggered that hitbox engagement mechanic or ranged units that don't turn around when a troop is engaged right next to them. Again, this is totally where a get good mentality would reign supreme, but the level of micromanagement has driven me insane more times than not while playing early access, and again, I think it has the potential to alienate a large portion of the audience because of it. And this is something that I definitely would love to hear your opinion on as well, so let me know in the comments section down below. In any case, I'm off of my combat soapbox, because you'll have plenty of practice understanding the nuances of combat yourself thanks to the multiple game modes, Campaign, Conquest, and Multiplayer. Realms of Ruin features three game modes, which will draw in just about any form of strategy player. I've already mentioned the Campaign, but with somewhere around 17 missions, don't quote me on that, it might be more, a little bit less, there's plenty of mission variety and content to soak up with this narrative. And this is a great starting point for those first playing this type of game, as it immerses you in a good variety of scripted situations, where you can test your metal against mechanics of the game in a quote-unquote safe environment, as it were. On completion of the campaign, or for those who may fancy themselves veterans of this type of game, you can drive straight into the conquest mode. The single-player challenge mode will lead you through a battle path of skirmishes with your favorite faction, taking on the enemy on a procedurally created map full of rule-breaking twists that can range from increased unit speed to a reduction in your victory score to being able to recruit more than one hero at a time. With limited lives, you'll look to gain the best scores you approach the final boss battle with crazier rule-breaking rules occurring the closer you get to said boss. I'll say this, I would consider myself a veteran of the genre, and I've juggled fair enough in my time playing. But even on veteran difficulty, the conquest mode is oftentimes brutal and relentless, and I've yet to make it to that final boss battle. Oh, fun thing too, these procedurally created maps on conquest mode are based on map seeds, meaning that you can copy pasta the seed settings, send them to your friends or community members to see just how far they get for some nice friendly competition. The last but by no means least mode is multiplayer, playable in 1v1 or 2v2 with any mix of human and AI teammates or opponents. You can choose to play as any of the four factions of the game across a range of maps and with a host of settings available to make the game type you want. Well, I say that as long as the game type involves capturing victory points to drain the other team down to zero. With these three modes, you'll find something that appeals to you. Personally, I'm not crazy about multiplayer, but Conquest has been a blast and I've enjoyed the campaign as well. You might like multiplayer only or your incredibly competitive group of friends wants to see who can get the highest score in Conquest using a really interesting seed. Any of these modes are great in my opinion, but what makes them even greater are the two additional pieces of this game, Army Livery, and the map editor. One of the best features in Realms of Ruin is the ability to paint your own army. I don't have to speak too much to this because it speaks for itself, but being able to either have a few standard Warhammer paint schematics for every faction, or being able to paint down to individual units within said faction, from bases to accents, 
is an incredibly fun experience that will satiate every player's dream of painting minis, but either couldn't afford them or didn't have the time, both which apply to myself. If that weren't enough, painting these units isn't just for kicks and giggles. No, these custom sets will be saveable and usable in both multiplayer and conquest mode. So now you can show off your own regimental color schemes and see them in action right in front of you. Realms of Ruin also has a very extensive map editor built into the game, allowing you to use a truly massive set of terrains, assets, map tools, colors, and settings to create your own unique map types, and then publish them online for others to play. I played around with this tool for a short period of time, and can definitively say the abilities within this program is something that modders and map makers of the genre will be so excited to play with, and I can't wait for the community at large to get to creating with this map editor. It's such an awesome addition to the game that will really jumpstart that multiplayer player base, which will go a long way to ensure the game's success and longevity without a doubt. And all of that to say, the game looks freaking fantastic. It just really does. Being able to zoom into those engagements and watch some Stormcast Eternals just rain havoc on some Aura Cruel Boys, or watch the Night Haunt's etherealness sway as you sit and wait for an ambush. Frontier didn't skip out on the rendering details in any form. Environments are alive, animations are smooth, cinematics are extremely cinematic. And it does all of this without tanking my FPS, which is saying something nowadays. There appears to be a lot of optimization to ensure that smooth experience, even in larger battles, where there might be 15 to 20 units all on screen at the same time, frames are still smooth. Very few things glitch through or cause problems. This has been the best constant throughout my entire experience in Realms of Ruin. While games certainly need to be playable over graphics, can't lie, this game's graphics soften the blow of any of the frustrations I have because, well, I just love watching battles take place up close and in detail. If there's one last thing that needs addressed though, it has to be bugs, audio, triggers, and otherwise. Now to be upfront, it's not like what I encountered bug-wise made the game unplayable, really just annoyances with maybe a side dish of frustration. I only ever experienced two major bugs that crashed my game and my time playing early access, and I couldn't repeat the issue, but there were some bugs that were present in my pre-release build that will hopefully be fixed by release or shortly thereafter. The biggest was more of an immersion breaker, with the always epic music present during cinematics being cut out when any of the characters spoke or made grunting noises or screams. This meant that in my campaign, cinematics had much less appeal, especially in a heroic battle when all you hear is the occasional grunt or scream with zero other audio filtering through, then for the music to come blaring back for half a second, only to lose it again when a character speaks. Aiden. I will take the fight to the Auric Warlord. You hold here with Demetrius. Honestly, might just start my campaign over when this audio bug gets fixed so I can experience what my cinematic should truly feel like. There were a handful of other bugs that occurred in my time playing and they included things like abilities not triggering despite hot keying or manually mouse clicking to enable, flying units not responding to grounding or movement orders and then subsequently getting killed, or even some instances where, despite having an abundance of the command resource, my troops refuse to obey my retreat order. To be perfectly frank and honest, these smaller bugs are things that I expect to find in anything pre-release. It's something I expect as a content creator. And knowing the back-end side of development personally due to working in the games industry working for a publisher. I'm much more forgiving of these minor bugs, and the audio bug is more humorous than it is annoying. However, as this is a review of the game and the state that I am playing, it means there's a chance that you, the person who might purchase this game, will experience the same things, and thus I feel it's definitely worth mentioning. Nothing I saw was really a deal breaker, but everyone always has their own opinions about such things. Now I've talked quite extensively about all things within Realms of Ruin, and it's time for my final verdict, yay or nay. Warhammer Age of Sigmar Realms of Ruin is an incredibly fun game to play, there's no other way to say it. All of the modes, be it gameplay with campaign, conquest and multiplayer, or the chance to paint your own army, create custom maps, they all point to a very passionate team that wants to make a successful Warhammer strategy game. And I think they created one. Yet my frustrations I still believe are entirely valid. The game does suffer from a reliance on knowing what you're doing at every microsecond of the game. 
knowing your hotkeys like in StarCraft 2, where any slacking can result in severe punishment. Something that Slanesh fans might actually enjoy now that I think of it. I've had my throwing controller moments a few times, and the rage quit was real in a couple of missions. Oh, and by the way, this is worth mentioning, this game is playable on controller right from launch, but no, I haven't tried it. But overall, I have enjoyed my time with the game in its various aspects. The unit rosters are balanced to counter each other in great ways, the campaign is fantastic so far, and I can already tell that multiplayer is going to be very intense. You're going to get some crazy meta builds that I'd never dream of. The price point of $60 is always a hard hit to take with strategy games though, and I don't know why to be honest. It's something you'd always expect of AAA games like Call of Duty, Modern Warfare, other first person shooters, but something always feels off about charging that much for a strategy game for some weird reason. It ultimately comes down to how much you play I suppose. If you'll really dive into all three modes, or even just all the single player ones, then it's surely worth the investment. If you're only in it for the campaign, maybe wait for a sale? Mulling it over, I can definitely see the value in the $60, and even though I received this for free, if I weren't a content creator, seeing all that's in store would be worth it for me. But again, it's just always a hard pill to swallow at a personal level, and it's only really tied to that strategy genre. I'll end it with this. Realms of Ruin is one of the better Warhammer games that I've played. The only Age of Sigmar game i played. Possibly the only Age of Sigmar game? I don't know. And I cannot wait to wrap this review up and get back to playing it. Thank you so much for watching this review. If you'd like to support the channel, you can purchase the game on release date via the link in the description. I don't recommend pre-orders. Or you can support the channel itself by subscribing, commenting with your thoughts down below, or becoming a member. Stick around for more strategy-related content. This is Havoc, and I'm out of here.